my dear friend colleague uh, said bhai ladies and gentlemen when we organized this event uh, the idea was to hear said bhai give an insightful talk on uh, all that's been hap happening on the arab street little did we know that uh, the day of his talk would coincide with so so much happening on the indian street whatever is happening what has happened this since this morning in india in our capital is a matter of deep concern and it deserves to be condemned a gandhian activist who has been campaigning against corruption has been arrested and sent to tihar jail the same jail where some of the scamsters have been sent but there's a difference friends those scamsters were sent because of the intervention by the supreme court whereas anna hazare and his team have been sent to tihar by the government itself we are not here to discuss the happenings on the indian street why did i then mention this right in the beginning of my introductory remarks this is because we at the observer research foundation do not discuss any issue from a purely academic standpoint we are deeply interested in the spread of democracy all over the world we are deeply interested in democracy becoming truly a genuine democracy in democratically governed countries in the world such as india and therefore even though the topic of today's talk is the arab spring we must begin by raising our voice in support of genuine democracy in support of probity in support of transparency and accountability otherwise even our democracy would be endangered and the signs are already visible friends uh until a few months ago tunisia egypt and some of these other countries in west asia were not uh, really part of the indian consciousness i remember that uh, the only time egypt used to make headlines on the front pages of indian newspapers was in the heady days of the non aligned movement in the 1950s when uh, the trio of pandit nehru gamal abdel nasser and tito were the leaders of the non aligned movement and uh, nasser was a household name and one of the persons who really made him a household name was my former editor rk karanjia editor of blitz with whom i had uh, the honor of working for many years karanjia who is of course now no more he interviewed many world leaders including nasser and uh, why i am mentioning you know karanjia in today's context is because i consider said bhai a very worthy successor to the legacy of rk karanjia because no other living indian journalist has covered so many international events and has interviewed so many world leaders as said nakvi has and today he is going to give a talk not based on just academic study but as my colleague radha mentioned 
he actually has traveled to all these countries and the talk he's going to give I'm sure will have uh, the flavor of a journalist but also the insight and the rigor of a scholar. So I have great pleasure friends in inviting Saeed Nakhvi Saab to give today's talk. Thank you very much. My colleague Sudhindra Kulkarni, I am not dropping names, but there happen to be two people in this gathering, at least, at least two, whom I used to interact with in detail when they were both deep in the Prime Minister's office in South Block. Prakash was an old, very dear old friend of mine. He was with, of course, Muraji Bhai. And uh, there are many anecdotes I can tell you about Prakash having organized a meeting with Muraji Bhai on television. And then when Mr. Atalji was the Prime Minister, Sudhendra was very much there. And every time one passed, one sat down with him and exchanged, exchanged views. So we are friends. And even other than prime ministerial connections, we have, our paths have crossed and now we are in the same organization, Observer Research Foundation. Uh, You know something, I had written a piece of paper in which I had scribbled some notes, but like always I have left that paper in, in the hotel, where, in the club where I'm staying. And uh, so I shall improvise as we go along. Yeah. Uh, we are discussing something about which all of us have read a great deal for the past few months. How many months? In, we are all, we are exhausting August. We shall soon be into September. And September, October, November, three months. And then we come to the month of December when Muhammad Bu Azizi set himself ablaze in Tunis because for having been slapped by a, a police woman in, in a village outside Tunisia, in Tunis. So in other words, a year will be over. And how rapidly things were moving and where have they stalled and where is that Arab Spring, I think, we shall be taking stock of all of this in about a year. We shall be observing, remember Sudhindra, 17th of December is the anniversary of the beginning of the spring. So keep, keep that aside because see where it has got stuck. Friends, what do you know about it? And what do I know about this Arab Spring? This is in an incantation, a recurring theme with me. And it is a recurring theme because I keep traveling. And I travel and I despair because the sources of our information are exactly the same who are the executioners, who are the authors, executioners, judge, jury, and informants, it is one and the same. So if you go back and read the first reports on Libya, for instance, and you compare it with the reports now, get somebody to do that homework, you will be amazed and appalled at the propaganda that we are subjected to. You will never ever know that. Because we also live with a degree of amnesia. They work on our amnesia. We've forgotten. We have forgotten, for instance, that 
on the 20th of March, 24, 24, 25 people of special forces and diplomats who landed in Benghazi to support the movement were arrested by those they were going to support. And then the all hell broke loose. Then Cameron said, oh my God, our, our people are going there to find out exactly what has happened. You and I don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. I know that in May, the first American CIA agent turned up with, a, with that um, satellite telephone. First, reluctantly. Because the Americans have been dragged into this conflict. Let me not... Let me not confuse you by picking up something in the middle. Let me begin at the beginning. The story, there are two ways of telling the story. How it began, and the other way is how I, and we, in fact, Aruna was also with me in, and part of this journey, how we investigated what happened. Let me begin the second approach. The most difficult visa to obtain these days is Bahrain. For the love of money, you can't get a visa to Bahrain. But with my luck, I had the foreign minister of Bahrain visiting us in Delhi, and I met him, interviewed him for my television program, and I said, sir, you are not giving us visas. He called the ambassador. He said, give him a visa to go to Bahrain. So I got a visa. So I turned up in Bahrain. Immediately, I was accosted by the government. And I was deposited at the hotel. I had booked in another hotel. I said, no. So I was put up at Gulf Hotel. Now, how the hell do I find out what's happening? From one government office to the other. We got hold of a taxi, and the local taxi, I told him, you take us, do you know the Vakaf, Vafak office? He said, no. Then I called up some local people, went, I went to the places where the situation is as follows. You see, we do not realize what is happening in the Middle East is a huge flare of Shia-Sunni conflict being built and promoted on a scale that you and I are not aware of. I will revert to uh, Bahrain. Let me give you the broad picture. Broad picture is that there are three faces. Trifala hai ye, Middle East. Mein. One is what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Egypt, is one phase. And that which was happening in Morocco is carrying on to Jordan, Jordan to, and it is Saad, and I will dwell a little bit on what is happening in Syria. This is one phase. The second is that which the Saudis are running. The Saudis are running is a huge swath of this area, and I shall dwell on that. And third is the solo event with Gaddafi negotiating all the minefields in Libya, laid rather inexpertly by both Sarkozy and, and David Cameron. And the American involvement in it is because, as you know, the Americans are busy with very serious problems of their own. It's a, it's a compounded tragedy that just when they were losing the theme in the Middle East, just then, the biggest catastrophe struck a country which was the countervailing force which had been created since World War II to the rise of China, which was Japan. Japan was absolutely knocked out by the tsunami and the nuclear uh, problems that you face. So you had uh, accumulated <coughs> the West 
was in deep trouble internally, beginning with Lehman Brothers in 2008 up to now. You have the, this, are we numero uno problem with China? Are we losing this? Can we lose it? Should we lose it? How do we thwart it? Meanwhile, Japan, the big countervailing force that you have nurtured and created, collapses almost under the weight of the tsunami. At that time, all of this is happening. The Americans do not want to get into a third Muslim country. They can't extricate themselves from Iraq and Afghanistan. Pakistan is another quicksand that they are in. And they simply, but they don't want to break NATO either. And you have, there's a cartoon in, uh, in a European newspaper in which Europeans are sitting and sipping Campari under an umbrella. And the butler, Uncle Sam is the butler, and he's standing there, he says, gentlemen, there's a fire out there, and it's near your house. And these gentlemen, these grandees sipping their Campari say, don't just stand there, go and put it out, please. So, and the Americans have reluctantly, they don't want to break NATO, so they're also notionally there, but this is a complete project where whether there will be egg on Cameron's face or not, only history will. Can you believe it? 1973 says that no fly zone. This, this is four month old. No fly zone. Why? Because you are killing your own people. So there will be a no-fly zone and we shall protect your people. Now this means that they can come here, theoretically, they can come here to protect the people here against a state. I mean the, the thin end of the wedge people have not realized that the United Nations can now intervene to protect the local people against the ruler. And this protection of the people has been going on for four months. Now they say, but we have to get him out. Now they say, but we have to take him out. And we have to kill him. Now he is going like a fox here and there. No one knows where he is. So this is one theme. Let me come to the much more complex and the crux of the matter at the moment, which is uh, the, what the Saudis are doing. The Saudis are the spider in the web in a major event in this area. What are they doing? When the Arab Spring, so-called, erupted, King Abdullah was convalescing. He was not well in Switzerland and Germany and I think somewhere else in Europe in two or three hospitals he'd been. When he heard, he came back and ailing 86 year old man comes back and he gets into meanwhile America is busy with its own problems Europe has created its um, the European problem is apparent so what does he do let me explain to you this is here you are this is Saudi Arabia now this is this is where their oil region is. Here is Manama and Bahrain. Now, 90% of Manama, of Bahrain, is Shia. The ruler, since the 19th century, the Khalifa family, is the ruler there. Now, they have been, if Egypt and Tunisia want people's power, then people here are also entitled to their power. Now, the minute you give power to the people in Bahrain, can you believe it? That the 90% of the population of Bahrain is described as the opposition. And when you go to your own embassy, when you go to your own embassy, they, I said, let us meet some of these people in the op. Oh, no, we are not in touch with them. We don't touch, talk to them because we are not allowed to. 
we are only dealing with the establishment and with the few Indians that we have in Bahrain. So therefore, 90% of the population of the state is the opposition. This 90% wants some participation in government, I think which is legitimate, which is exactly what people in Tunisia wanted, which is what in Egypt wanted. No. A deal had been struck in which Jeff Feltman, the American envoy and the crown prince and the local Shia leader, um, Sheikh Salman, they had worked out a deal in which they will get some minimal participation in local power. Came Abdullah from his uh, um, hospital and he is weak, mind you. Succession is the issue. The next man, Prince Naif, he gets in touch with the Prime Minister who is the Crown Prince's uncle and he says, listen, you scuttle all this because if, if by now look at the geography in your mind, if Bahrain, the Shia population is able to come on top, then that causeway 37 kilometer links with Dahran, Dammam and Qatif where again a majority is Shia and that is where all the Saudi oil is. So it, therefore the flare from there will grow and create problems for us in Saudi Arabia which is where the oil is. Now this fixation with the Shia Sunni fixation, it begins, it was always there historically the Arab and Ajam, but it became rather pronounced, it became pronounced after 1979. In 1979 what happened is that the Shah of Iran left the Ayatollahs to Cuba. Suddenly there was this, the Shiaism became the big ogre in uh, uh, in the uh, minds of many establishments, particularly in the GCC and Saudi Arabia leading that. Islam became bipolar. You had two Islamic poles. One was in Riyadh, the other was in Tehran. Somehow they managed. Ahmad bin Najat came, came to Makkah, got together with with King Abdullah, they wanted to work out some kind of a modus vivendi, but then something else happened. A friend of mine, M.J. Akbar, he says, Said, if the Shias have 12 Imams, Asna Ashari Shias have 12 Imams, he says, if you could get a 13th, you know who would that be? I said, who Akbar? He says, it would be George W. Bush. <laughs> Why? Because without knowing what he was up to, they went and occupied the country. They listened to people like Chalabi and others, dismantled the Ba'ath structure. And what happened? So mind you, the Shah go goes, Ayatollahs have come in Iran. Now suddenly you find in, uh, in, uh, on, in April, April 9, 2002, you have this suddenly, the Shia 60, suddenly I, re, I realized for the first time that 65% to 70% of the population of Iraq is Shia. So now Ayatollah is there, next door you've got Shia, Shias in Iraq, now you've got Bahrain flaring up, Third, something that I did not know. The other day, in the assembly in Kuwait, a scuffle broke out between the Shia and the Sunni members of the assembly. Why? Because the Sunnis said, look, the Arab Spring has broken out. It's all goodwill all around us. Now all those Kuwaitis 
who are in Guantanamo Bay. Ask the Americans to send them back to us now. It's all over. The Shia members got up and they said, here's the time to twist the knife in them and tease the Sunnis out. They said, no, 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 no. We shall not get those people back. They are Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, as you know, are monsters. We can't get them. Let them die there. Now the, they were twisting the knife into the Sunnis. So the, the Sunni members and the Shia members, they came, they took out their sticks and they opened their belts and there was a regular scuffle. So now you discover that 40% of the population of Kuwait is Shia. Now mark my word, you had the problem in, in always in Iran, then the Shah goes, then uh, Iraq, 65% Shia, now 40% of Kuwait, Bahrain, the Shias are rising 80 to 90%. Now what the hell do we do? And here, in Yemen, strange place. Now let me explain to you Yemen. Yemen is over here was Aden and here you got Sana. Sana is the capital of North Yemen and Aden was the capital of South Yemen. Until the 90s what was the picture? You had Nasser's holdover socialist movement controlling southern Yemen. And before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviets had considerable say over the events in Aden. So now while a battle is being uh, prepared for in Afghanistan, what is the battle? Soviet Union has occupied Afghanistan. How are we going to fight it? We are going to create our own Mujahideen. Who is going to create it? Well, Saudis are going to provide the money. Americans with the, the, um, the wherewithal and ideas and personnel. And Ziaul Haq is going to execute that project. But Prince Naif says, no. Yes, we shall of course do that. But do you know that these are Muslims from another area. We need thoroughbred Arab uh, Mujahideen because we have a problem with socialism and pro-Soviet regime in Aden. So we shall have a homegrown body of Mujahideen in Sana, in the area of Sana in, in Yemen. So therefore, the same source that is plaguing Afghanistan, Pakistan, that area, and us to some extent, because the border is there, the exactly the same, um, uh, same source creates and manufactures Al-Qaeda, which is now Al-Qaeda in the Arab Peninsula, which is plaguing, not plaguing Saudi Arabia. Now, have you got the picture right? Prince Naif is financing and training two camps, one in Afghanistan, which we know about, the other one is in Yemen. That is against the Soviet Union, this is against the Soviet influence in southern uh, uh, Yemen, in Aden. In 1990, when everything went haywire, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Saddam Hussein got into the act and got the Aden and Sana to come together in that union and Saleh was made the president of the United Yemen. Then Saddam Hussein went in 19... Now Yemen is a very interesting phenomena. The caliphate ended by Mustafa Kemal Pasha in Turkey the, in the 20s, but the Imamat continued in Yemen, the only place in the world until 1968. How? Because when the battle of Karbala was fought in 680, 
one of the grandsons of Imam Hussein, the Prophet's grandson, he said the, the war against Yazid has to be waged. It can't be a peaceful Gandhian approach. So he went over to Yemen and organized himself. Now you have a whole lot. His name was Zayed. So you have a whole lot of Zaydis there who are claimed both by Sunnis and Shias, but they are more Shia than Sunni. Now you've got the Houthis. When this Imam was chased out, Imam Yahya in 1968 by Nasser, where did he? He struck a deal with the Saudis. He gave them two districts of Jizan and uh, Nazaran, and he had a deal with the Saudi Arabia. Now Saudi Arabia therefore has in its southern border a whole lot of Shias who now call themselves Houthis. So you have a very aggressive Shia movement in flanking Saudi Arabia in the south. Now do you see the ring from Iraq to um, uh, Kuwait to Bahrain to Yemen Saudis are now seeing themselves as being besieged. So they are striking out in all directions. This is one, one picture. The, now this brings you to Syria. What is happening in Syria? If you can remove Saddam Hussein, who was a Baathist, but the Baathist with the majority with the minority Sunni support. Exactly the opposite is the picture in Syria. You've got the Alawites who are sort of more Shia than Sunni, shall we say. So you've got Alawites who are a minority in Baghdad, the Sunnis are the minority. Now, first they did not know what to do. Now the Saudis have made up their mind that look. If the Shias can come to power in Iraq, why can't we somehow get a Sunni? Because what is the picture in Syria? Syria is controlled by a family of Assad. The family of Assad are Alawites. Alawites are an 11% minority and they have been ruling the defense minister as Alawite. But the Ba'athist Qada is both Alawite and, Sh and Sunni. Now, so Saudis have now recently, so, so have the Turks. Now, do you see how the whole thing is linked? From, from here to Syria, Saudi, Syria, Syria into Turkey. And you are now virtually reaching the Balkans if you carry on like that. So it is all interconnected. And there is no resolution. Here, the Arab Spring in North Africa has a very pronounced African face. We only look at it as its Mediterranean face, but it has a very pronounced African face. There are any number of issues simmering in Africa. In Africa, is, that is where the next battle, that is where the next um, tussle for resources, for minerals, for oil, for energy, for everything is. And therefore, and when a man called Gaddafi got disenchanted with his Arab friends, he said, a plague on all your houses because you've all changed and you've all become lackeys of Americans and Zionists. I am now turning into Africa. So he began to support movements in Sudan. He began to chard. He went as far as Sierra Leone. This Charles Taylor, who was caught in Liberia, I mean, he was being supported by... So you, if Europeans have to take an interest in Africa, Mr. Gaddafi's links with all the African movements have to be snapped. 
That is one reason why Qaddafi, that is one aspect of the Qaddafi project. Second, he has the kind of sweet oil for which European refineries are geared for. So if we can get this oil, which is in the Benghazi in the eastern area, then that is number two. Number four, number three, no one knows that Gaddafi had a huge, the great river project. That whole country is sitting on the, the world's biggest aquifers of water. An area where water is going to be where the next battle is, he has created uh, about 1,600 wells and there's a whole river. He calls it the huge river project. And that river project is the water that on one end you've got oil and the other is loads and loads of water. The Nile may run out, but the water in the aquifers of Libya will not run out. That's another uh, a big story. Fourth, he is a very cocky man. He is a megalomaniac. He is a narcissist. He loves himself. And at various summits, he has insulted uh, King Abdullah directly. There have been Tutu Meme, you know, as you have on uh, Indian television programs. You've had this between, uh, uh, between Qaddafi and King Abdullah. So King Abdullah wants his head on a platter. So that is, this roughly is the picture in the area. Now, I have not mentioned one very important dimension of the whole thing, which is the, possibly the crux of all, the mother of all problems. I was talking to Dan Meridor, the Minister for Intelligence and Deputy Prime Minister, one of the cleverest men in, in Israel. And if he becomes Prime Minister, I think Israel someday people hope, because he's a he, he's a moderate man, no, not like Lieberman and these other uh, complete nut cases. He told me, he said, look, what the Arab Spring teaches us is humility. How, I said, he said, because with all this huge intelligence network that we boast of, we had no clue that Bouazizi's death is going to lead to all this. That's modesty, he says, humility, number one. Number two, when the leaders of, uh, of uh, Gaza, Mashal, and uh, uh, who is in, actually in Damascus, and Mahmoud Abbas, they were not on talking terms. They had two different approaches. But then they found that Egypt had changed, that Saddam was gone. Whole lot of uh, Mustafa Barghouti, he is the one who negotiated the deal between uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Mashal. And he was in and out of Ramallah to Cairo, Cairo to Damascus, Damascus. And they worked out a deal between them. So there was peace between Gaza and Ramallah. And they are talking of elections in September, together, joint elections. Meridor tells me that this is, we all are, in the olden days, anything happening in Cairo would be furnished to Jerusalem, and their intelligence would process it before the Egyptian intelligence got to know. But already this change had taken place, that these meetings took place in Cairo and Damascus, and Jerusalem knew nothing about it. And that's important. But these things, either they happen like this, or you allow them to gestate, and the counter punch is there. So the counter attack has already begun. What is the counter attack? They opened the Refah crossing which had been closed by Israel, they opened it. 
who the new, new Egypt opened it. Somewhere pressures have been brought to bear. Rafa is back again. Now it is closed again. Elections were going to be held in September. The buzz now is that the elections are going to be delayed. So much for the Arab Spring. On what pretext are they going to be delayed? Because in September, a very important resolution is going to be introduced in the UN General Assembly recognizing the state of Israel as part of a two-state solution. Now this fait accompli in which both Mahmoud Abbas and all the, all the Arab countries and various countries, the majority in the UNGA is for it and that is the, you could not have had that issue in the vortex of Egyptian politics if elections in Egypt were to be held also in the month of September. So therefore those elections are now no longer. What will happen is that the army, this stage drama, this as I wrote somewhere, that if Macbeth is the tragedy of ambition, then the Hosni Mubarak drama being played out in a cage in Cairo is a melodrama on that theme. I mean, he is, uh, there is nothing, there was never anything heroic about, about Mubarak. And for a great tragedy, you need a hero. He is, here he is pitiable. It's pitiable pathos. That's, that's what it is, what we are watching. And why is the army doing it? The army is doing it. Look, this is how far we have gone in punishing Mubarak. And now this case is going to drag on and on and on. Then the army will be there. Army will be there for a little longer, then a little bit longer. Then the engulfing tumult will make them indispensable to be there for very much longer. So therefore the script is already changing. So what you have is not an Arab spring. We shall take stock of it in the month of December, 17th, remember, Buazizi's death. And after that, we shall take stock. And now I, I would like to stop here because this gives you more or less, I have tried to cram in as much of uh, information for you. And uh, if there are any questions, I have completely left out the Indian dimension because there is just no time. But if there are questions, I'll answer that. Thank you very much. Also being, yeah, I, I am Muhammad Wajiuddin. I am a journalist with the Times of India. Uh, you know, this whole Arab Spring is also being described as uh, perhaps it will uh, mutate into an Arab hell. And uh, why is it being said, we you know is very well. But I would like to know, since you have traveled widely in the Middle East uh, recently and uh, earlier as well, uh, you know, how much this factor of Islamic fanaticism you know, we have Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt, we have certain, those uh, extremist elements in Saudi Arabia and many other places. How much this uh, Arab Spring is going to give them a boost up? Do you see any rise in Islamic fanaticism because of this uh, Spring? Thank you. Those of you who saw the pictures and the sounds from Tahrir Square and from Tunisia, would see that there is this youth which is as liberated, liberal. You know, there is this youth bulge. It's a cliche, but it is a fact that you have 60, 70 percent people who are in their 15, 16, 17, and 15 to 35. That is the majority of the people who are in the street. Now, they want real change. People want change. 
as the Anna Hazari people here, they want change. <laughs> no, they want change. But the whole point is, who, what are the instruments, or instrumentalities of this change? The only, ex in any democracy, change can come about in various ways and we know it. But in a dictatorship and an Islamic dictatorship, or a dictatorship where the majority is Muslim, to put it more accurately, the only ventilators are the mosques. This is precisely what happened in, in, uh, in Iran. You see, the, the, the mullahs were working in the mosques because the Shah, the Shah Savak was, was everywhere, and, but not in the mosques to that extent. So, and suddenly when the, what the revolution took place, it surprised everybody. In, uh, this is the problem. So the only ventilators in these societies are the mosques. So you have the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. You see, this is a shorthand that, oh, Muslim Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood means fundamentalism. Fundamentalism means they are going to uh, blow up and you will have... Uh, now, something that the Saudis have realized, are beginning to realize, is, as we should realize, that there is no such thing as an Islamic monolith. I've described to you the Shia Sunni dimensions of it. There is the Bengali Muslim and Sayyid Naqvi, we have very little in common. I mean, I have much more in common with my friend Prakash Shah. We can sit together and talk because the Bengaliness is not in me. The, why did Bangladesh break away from Pakistan? Because of its Bengali identity. It, the Islam was not a good enough glue to keep them together. It was the Bengali-ness which asserted itself. Similarly, me and the Mopla, my Mohammed Koya was the chief minister for a few days in, in Kerala, and he I was editor of papers there, and he invited me for a meal, and he knew very little Urdu, I knew no Malayalam, and so it was a dialogue in signs virtually, and uh, at the end of it, he gave me, by way of dessert, seven varieties of bananas, which was a culture shock to me. My friend Indar Gujral was taking a delegation to Dhaka as Prime Minister. So he thought that since a notional Muslim had to be there on that delegation also, so he thought Saeed Naqvi will be a nice high-profile Muslim who would get him to fit into this, his uh, framework. Now, who were the others? Nikhil Chakarvarti was there and Kirla, Hiran Mai Karlikar, so many Mukhapadhyay and so many Banerjees and so many Mukherjees, they were all there. And Saeed Nakhvi. Now, Indar obviously didn't know his Bangladesh. He's not well, he's very, very unwell these days. When I turned up in Dhaka, I have never been, you have never seen a more lonesome Muslim in your life. I mean, all these chaps, these Mukherjees and Banerjees and, and Dasas and, and Nikhil Chakravarti, they were, hello, 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 yelish, mash, kabo, khush hai. <laughs> and here I was holding my Islam in a corner and there was not a person to talk to me. The Bengali, Bengali-ness had superseded everything else. You see, so this business of, that there's no, in India there is no monolithic Islam, which is a complete fabrication of, of minds, which, which don't understand societies. Likewise, the Saudis have discovered something very interesting. Sudhendra. What have they discovered? They've discovered that 50, the largest Muslim population in that region happens to be Egypt with 50 million population. That Egypt from 911 to 1175 was Fatimid. 
Fatimid means Shia, not 12 Imams, but 7 Imams. The Boras that you have here in, in, in Bombay. This Fatimid empire stretched to, first it was the headquartered in Tunis. It stretched as far as uh, Sicily. Most people don't know that Sicily for 400 years was Muslim, under Muslim rule. Sicily, Palermo, the main church there has a column which, is, uh, which has a, um, a mosque and Arabic uh, inscribed there. In fact, I, some Tariq, Tariq Ali wrote a novel on, on, that, uh, on, uh, on that theme. The Fatimids, Al-Azhar University, is named after Fatima Zahra. Fatima Zahra is the Prophet's daughter and married to Ali, who is the basis of the entire difference of opinion between the Shia and the Sunni theology. One is, uh, one is for and the other is not for. And in between, so you have in Egypt, an Islam in Tunisia, an Islam which is very, very, uh, which is not at all like the Wahhabi or the, or, or the Salafis in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Completely different. Their, clo their concerns are different. For instance, they are not obsessed with the Iran's nuclear weapons. They are more interested in Hamas, Iran's role with Hamas and with Hezbollah. This is the Egyptian uh, preoccupation. And the Islam is of a softer Sufi type, as you get in, in um, the king of Morocco, King Hassan, he is called Amirul Momineen. He is supposed to be a direct descendant of Imam Hassan. So the, the, the whole mosaic as it is emerging, you suddenly find that the majority is a minority and the minority is a majority. It's all very, very confusing. And the funny thing is that we, in our South Block, have not taken note of any of it. We took our eyes off Middle East the day non-alignment ended. We were, our, in, our involvement with the Middle East, it turns out, was part of the outreach during non-alignment, when Nehru and Nasser and others got together, over the day Soviet Union collapsed, we lurched one way, and when uh, the only friend who stood by us in, since 1973 among the Muslim countries uh, was uh, Saddam Hussein, since 1973, on every vote within OIC or outside it, he was with us on Kashmir, and when the Americans occupied it, we kept it. Not because we had less, the world had changed and we had positioned ourselves, heaven knows how. We have, um, instead, of, uh, instead of shifting, we lurched and we sort of made a scramble one way and now we are correcting that scramble. In that, we've also made some mistakes in Iran. We have completely, we have, you know, can you imagine, we should have been the people who would have had knowledge of what is happening in these Arab societies. And, but we don't. We don't. We have, uh, we, in no country do we have an ambassador who speaks Arabic. You find Chinese, you have Russians, you have Americans, you have uh, British, each one of them at the stations in, in, the, in West Asia speak Arabic. Our ambassadors do not. We don't even have people in the embassy who speak the language. Nor have we had people in Iran. I mean, uh, uh, Prakash would tell us who speak, uh, who speak Persian. It is a complete, we have blanked ourselves out. And now the important, the, the challenge is to re-engage with this world. And to re-engage, you at least have to know. And to know, you have to have the elementary thing of having journalists there. You don't have a single, all that you read and see is, as I said, judge, jury, executioner, informant is the same source. You have no journalists, you have no inform, uh, information base, no scholars, 
who are in any one of these countries informing us. It is sad. And each one of these countries is a few hours, two hours, three hours flight, flying time away from here. You mean to say your papers don't have the money? It is a peculiar acceptance. You know, this, the decolonization of the mind has just not taken place in some, some instances, I find. My answer, yes, sir. Jihadism, that's why you will find this notion of Islam, Islamophobia. So, what you already mentioned in Egypt, and lately somebody wrote a very moving book, and he, they mentioned that the, almost all youth have the consensus. They want democracy. They, they, they want rule of law. They want separation of power. So this is the current. The second question I would like to know that, as you mentioned about Egypt, now liberal has a very, in a very sticky situation that military is intervening. And whoever come to the power, they have the right to write, uh, write the constitution. So it, it would be a sort of military intervention, always as happened in Turkey. And this Muslim Brotherhood, if Muslim Brotherhood would come up... What they, is your question, sir? Muslim Brotherhood would come up, they will write constitution in accordance with So liberal would be defeated in this way. And third, you just say a little bit, because people are saying that Islam and this democracy does not jelly well. But the vital example is Turkey. You just mentioned something, how it, this Islamic party came to power, they gave more democracy, a democratic space, and it is true that previously in the name of secularism, democracy was taking away from the people. This was the obvious. Prakash, you think, Sunni? I'll answer both at the same time. <clears throat> no, I have a couple of observations and a query uh, to you. The first, of course, is that I think most of what you said probably justifies the kind of feeling I have had having lived in that region before, that there is no such thing as an Arab. The whole Arab League, for instance, which has all the so-called Arab countries as the members, has never really made any major contribution towards an Arab cause least of all towards Palestine. Because there is no such thing as Arab unity, and therefore to talk about Arab Spring as a result of what happened in Tunisia and Egypt, I think would be a, a miscalculation of what is going to happen in the future. Mm. So that's one point I wanted to make. The second is that, as you point out, Shia-Sunni differences and even hostility is the number one issue in whatever is happening in the region that you went around and what you, de what you described, uh, having served both in Iran and being special envoy of the UN to Iraq, two countries where this... The point is that we knew about the Shia-Sunni problems even before what you mentioned, and actually the Iraq-Iran war was fought precisely to ensure that the um, that the fall of the Shah did not end up in Iranian advance towards Saudi Arabia and into Saudi Arabia through the Iraqi Shia population and of course Bahrain and, and, and Kuwait, etc., etc. Which is why actually Iraq, which had the manpower to, to sacrifice, was asked as a Sunni leader to fight the war. They lost a million people, for example. But the entire $75 billion that was spent by the Iraqis, almost all of them were provided by Saudi, Kuwait, America, Japan, et cetera, et cetera. And, the un and one of the main reasons, this is a diversion, why Iraq invaded Kuwait was the misunderstanding between the Americans and the Iraqis who felt Saddam Hussein felt that they, were that encouraged. they can take over the neutral zone mm. and the oil in the neutral zone as a, uh, a, 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 a so, because of the sacrifices they made. But anyway, the Shia Sunni issue, as you pointed out, is the major issue. In one of my articles, which is not published here, but published in Canada, Japan, and Australia, mm. I have discussed the Sunni factor in Iran's nuclear ambition. Mm. 
mm. but mm. somehow it never caught on, mm. a discussion never caught on. But that is my observation. Mm. My question to you is, how is the so-called Arab Spring in Tunisia, Syria, um, Egypt, etc., relevant to India when the issues that I, I'm going to pose you should be concerning us and we really, as you mentioned, we are not really quite aware of what to deal with it. Three important Indian interests. There are by now, I think, about 7.5 million Indians in the arc between Saudi Arabia and Oman, employed there, immigrants, or temporary immigrants. Almost $50 billion were sent this year as uh, repatriation money to India, which is extremely important to the Indian economy. And the third is that almost 70% of India's oil imports come from these countries. And because of the peace that still exists in the uh, Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, whatever you want to say, and the Straits of Hormuz, because that's where all our oil mainly comes from. Now, how far the so-called Arab Spring will hit the Gulf countries? How far is what Saudi Arabia doing anti-democracy, but doing in order to keep GCC as it is, run undemocratically by the Sheikh Dums? And yet, the point about India's interest in those countries is never really been discussed. If if the Arab Spring were to get into the Gulf, what would happen to if the oil? If they were to get into the GCC countries, yes, yes, and there would be what you wanted to happen: the Bahrain population taking over the government mm -hmm. in uh, in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. What would happen in those countries? Mm -hmm. What would happen to India's 7.5 million mm -hmm. Indians? What would happen to India's? Uh, dependency on, on, on energy, mm. particularly oil and gas in the mm. Gulf, and the consequent uh, money that comes in. And finally, one a subject which generally has not been, or maybe you avoided it deliberately, is that the Islamic terrorism of which Pakistan, of course, is the hotbed in my view, mm. has been kept away Mm. by the GCC countries mm. very deliberately mm. and very uh, high-handedly mm. mm. in terms of saying, mm. we will have Indians come and work here. Mm. We don't want 7.5 million Pakistani mm. to work here because we don't want terrorism in our region. Mm. So do you want to say something about this? And what should India be doing in case the so-called Arab Spring were to hit GCC countries? So I wanted to ask you how uh, strong Saudi is uh, by itself, because uh, uh Let me begin somewhere. Uh, GCC, Saudi Arabia. Something happened in 1973. Islam as a terror, Islam as a monster, Islam as all of this would have been, would have been fixed in 1973 itself. The war would have been joined once the Arabs quadrupled the, the, the price of oil. Had the West not been involved with the bigger war, which was the Cold War. Had the, they left it pending. Those were the days that you would remember and I remember when Marx and Spencer's was in Arabic. The sheikhs of Arabi had taken over Oxford Street. Oxford Street the, you couldn't get a room in Dorchester and Savoy. After that, Antichrist had entered the very citadel, but a bigger battle was on, which was with the Soviet Union, and therefore this matter was left uh, untouched in those days. And now, of course, it was being negotiated 
if Lehman Brothers had not started the slide, the world would have looked different. Indians. Business, Prakash, as you know, has no religion. The Saudis, when they became flush with money, naturally the first beneficiaries were the Muslims. Indian Muslims from Kerala and elsewhere, they started some Hyderabad, they went there, got started and got jobs. But then they realized. So you had Kerala Christians, you had Hindus and more Hindus and more Hindus. Today in Saudi Arabia, the Muslims are not at a premium. I'm sorry to report this to you. The people whom they actually at the higher echelons of the jobs are Hindus, non-Muslims. Why? Four reasons. They're better educated. In the month of Ramadan, the points I'm going to be spelling out, you will not like it. They're better educated. They don't t take breaks five times a day for namaz. And they don't take breaks for the whole month for Ramadan. And they don't expect a special dispensation because they belong to the same faith. So therefore, they find the Hindu management card. Therefore, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find... Or Dubai, you will find that the top cadres are non-Muslims. It's something we don't realize. We don't realize that this is the way it is. How this Arab Spring will shape itself uh, is very, very difficult to predict. As I've told you, already the counter. A very interesting uh, meeting I had with Ahmad Chalabi in, in uh, Baghdad. He is a very intelligent man, very deeply. He was uh, tipped to be the first prime minister. He's a, he, he doesn't have the best reputation for, for probity and honesty and that, those kinds, but he's a very wily politician. He said something to me. I said, listen, you are being blamed for all the chaos that you let loose in Iraq. Because this, all that these people, the Americans have done is, but the local infrastructure should have been in place to run the administration. You said, smash the Ba'ath party. So de-Ba'athification became the source of all the chaos that happened. He says, Said, you don't realize something. Had I not done that, do you know what is going on? I said, what? He said, the celebrations in Tunisia and in Egypt are premature because the in all institutions that were nurtured under Mubarak are there. So what I did and what I advised the Americans to do in my interest was to smash the whole structure. Of course, the country was destroyed, but then we could begin from scratch and it would be us. That's what he said. He said, what is happening in, and you can see it. He said, what is happening in Egypt and in Tunisia is celebration which is premature. Because the entire infrastructure of Saddam, you were wheeling him into in, in that cage in a, as a pathetic character saying, yes, I agree or I don't agree. But who is he? There was a huge infrastructure that he, that was there under him. That is, each one of them is there and they will return to plague you, he said. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling that that is, that is probably not the kind of prediction that one should take lightly. Because already the evidence is there. The, the counter attack has already begun. And at the moment, the West is feeling not very muscular, but sh but then not feeling, it's, it's the wounded tiger that actually leaps at you, you know. It, is, it, could be, it could work both ways, that the West is not muscular. And therefore you, so they, a very, very, we are looking at a world in complete and total transition. Nothing can be predicted. 
how it will happen, to, what will happen to the GCC. All I know is that the people who had gone to Egypt, to uh, Dubai to make money, are now coming back to India. Because the sheikhs there are now, um, they are, it is not, you, it's not the Arab Spring that is coming. It is the economy that is pinching them now. That now they find that they will have to find jobs for their own people. So therefore, uh, any number of Indians and Pakistanis and others are being handed the hat. Now you carry on. It is happening. And it is not the Arab Spring. It's not because of any democratic change there. It is the economy is stupid. That is, it is uh, closing in on the regimes in the Middle East, in GCC also. So that, uh, and how it will ultimately play, pan itself out, no one can say. Because it's an extremely unpredictable picture. We don't know what is going to happen in Greece, what's going to happen in Portugal, what's going to happen in... What happened in London? For four or five days, what we saw in London? I mean, there is an interconnection somewhere there. And, uh, and what is like what happened in, uh, in France a year ago? In a year ago in France, there was a Muslim dimension to the problem because they were mostly Algerians and Moroccans and Tunisians. Here at least it's all West Indians. So that Muslim factor has not come in. So the Muslim was breathing a sigh of relief. Thank God we are not in it. Yes. So, yes, sir. Yes, madam, you're, you're, you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sir, I wanted to ask, uh, it occurred to me that, uh, sorry, yes, it yes. occurred to me that the whole, all of the Middle East, um, I frequently ask this question, that uh, the complete Middle East, as per my understanding, is generating oil to the tune of $1 billion per day. Yes. Now, $1 billion is if you spend $1 million every day for 365 days, for three years, you touch $1 billion. Now, the money that is generated per day is $1 billion in the whole of the oil in, uh, oil in the Middle East. Now, my question is, why has India and why is India not aligning itself and becoming friendly with the Arab world? I think it's because the Americans have vested interest. They've kept the, the, the Arab world fighting amongst themselves and are keeping Indians away from Arabs. And we are not using our minds. Our leadership is not uh, controlled enough to use our Muslims and make them friends we should be closer to them because we have the largest, second largest Muslim population. So uh, in the, that way India and that way America, the whole dynamics of world politics will change. Your views on this and your comments please. Well, this Muslim as the bridge to Middle East is, uh, this is a very complex uh, issue. Uh, let me first address the easier one. You're right. The, you see, the oil is here. Oil is here. This is where the oil is. Over here. And there's oil is here. This area. And of course, there's oil and gas in Iran. Uh, very little oil in Oman and the rest of it. This is where the jhagada is going on. I told you that his links with, the, with this area have to be snapped. There is a belt here that is being created. You are going to have Muslims south of it, north of it, and you are going to have Christians south of it. I mean, it is a straight line is being drawn. So, when it comes to Nigeria, you will have uh, the northern part, which is mostly Muslim. And here, what is the jhagra in? They have more or less halved. They have actually partitioned Sudan. After World War II, we were told that all the boundaries were inviolate. They will never ever be changed. They've changed it once. Now they're changing another one, which is Darfur. Now, Darfur 
they have found that in adjacent chard there is oil. There's a lot of oil in chard and in that area. What is the game? The game as you know, the British never were nastier anywhere than they were in Sudan. You know the whole battle of with the Mahdi whose whose grave was dug up and he is his sort of skull was taken by Kitchener and, uh, and delivered to, uh, to the Queen in the 19th century. So that they have, the British have a very... Churchill, at the age of 23, covered that war. The brilliant dispatches by, by Churchill in those days. Now what is happening here? It's very interesting, uh, Sudendra. Darfur is Dar means gate, dar, darwaza. Four is the tribe. So this the dar four is was a 16th century sultanate from where the chadar to Mecca used to go and be placed on the, uh, on the shrine ahead of the Ottoman shrine. That is dar four. Dar four has two other tribes, Zagawa and Masilat, now, what the jhagra here is that the West is playing up that these Egyptian, these Arabization, of, there's, no, there's no Muslim Christian jhagra here. But they're saying that look, the Arabization of the African Muslims is taking place, which should stop. So you have any number of interests blocking this as making this the, the reason for for the conflict here in, in Darfur. It's all oil. I, I mentioned it because that also is oil. Now, <clears throat> as far as Indian, why don't we be friends? We have very good friendship with the, our sources of oil have never been disrupted. All the energy that we need, we get from them. Our sources with Saudi Arabia, I mean, until this recent uh, um, uh, mistake, a mistaken vote according to me, in Vienna, but otherwise our relations with, uh, with Iran were excellent. So therefore our, relation, our practical relations have been very good. But in depth, our sort of civilizational sweep, the amount of respect that we have in these countries, we are not aware of. We, are not, we have begun to see things in Hindu, in, in Muslim, non-Muslim terms, in our minds, unfortunately. You know, these are all Muslims and they'll, they'll be different from us. I'm sorry I'm being as blunt as I am. Because there is a Muslim, non-Muslim thing that is searched through our sensibilities, our minds. And which is, it is, we spill the baby with the bathwater. Because if you go, nowhere in the world are you respected more than in this region that I'm talking about. Al-Hind. Kishwar hind Hind. What India is, your civilization, your culture, your people, to this, not Pakistan. Pakistan is a problem. Contrary to the imagination here, in the minds. The sort of communalization of our minds. That somehow Pakistan has greater passage there. You know something, you will be amazed when Nelson Mandela formed his first government. Nine members of that cabinet were people of Indian origin. Nine members. Of those nine, eight happened to be Muslims. Now these were all Muslims. There, there's a reason. There's a sociolog sociological, historical reason why they happened to be Muslims. Because they were the people who were sons in, of big businessmen in South Africa. And they had studied in, in the big universities and the metropolitan centers of control. And therefore, they were in the leadership position with Mandela and others. So they were. Now my friends, absolute dear friends, he says, Saeed, he says, Ali, itne bahut sare musalmanon ko isne guzral diya hai cabinet mein. Ye to sab Pakistan ke ho jayenge. I mean, it was amazing. Can you imagine Nelson Mandela, poor fellow, who never <laughs> thought about it? That his nine of them are instead of saying, look, nine Indians, 
this fellow said nine of them are Muslim, they'll all go to Pakistan. I mean, this, this kind of mindset. So the nine members in Mandela's cabinet, the principal people in, who were his, uh, his and Thabo and Beki's, uh, like principal secretaries, chef de camp, the cabinet, were in first scale Ahmad Katharada, in the second scale Yusuf Pahar. This is a case, this is a fact. And the, how, the point I'm making again and again is that in our minds something has happened. We must correct that. But as far as, yes, we are a mosaic of many communities of which Muslims are, and therefore that, that can be an advantage in dealing and negotiating. It harmonizes people both ways. It's a good idea. But I'm totally against two things. A, with this question that is raised every now and again, why don't you have a liberal Muslim leader? And I say this is a contradiction in terms, how can you have a liberal Muslim leader? How can, then you'll have a liberal Thakur leader, then you'll have a liberal Brahman leader. I say you can, it is a contradiction in terms, in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, Sudhendra Kulkarni will be my leader and I'll stand behind him. Or, if I am the leader, then he will have to stand behind me. So you will have to knit it this way. You can't have a, a, a sort of a liberal Muslim leadership. You can't. Because it's a contradiction in terms. Because you're dividing. You are, you're creating a ghetto again. You see? You, then you, you are creating a Muhammad Ali road which will live there, exist there, think only of itself and, and ultimately uh, uh, tear itself away in its mind. And you from them. You see? So we have to have an interconnected. That leads me to the other issue, which is I have never for the life of me understood why the Indian ambassador to Saudi Arabia has to be a Muslim. Oh, because Hajis go, Ari Baba, Hajis go from every country in the world, even from America. Our ambassador doesn't have one hundredth the access that the American ambassador has, that other embassies, the European ambassadors do. This, this tokenism, because what it does is, you give him one slot as the Saudi ambassador will be for the Muslims, then you can block out all the others for him then. It's a trick. You follow? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Just to add to this, mm. I was in Tehran. Mm. Uh, the mm. One of the Tehran leaders said, mm. why is it mm. India sends Muslims that they should talk to us? Mm. We would be much happier mm. to talk to whoever is the leadership, Hindu or whatever it is, because at least we would know mm. that we are talking, whatever we are talking is going to go, go back to the government. Why should there be only a Muslim appointed by the government mm. who come to talk to us and we don't even know whether he is a, pardon my saying so, mm. puppet or not? <laughs> we want Indians to come and do it. And the same thing should be true of the Arab countries. We have lots of good relations. But if the question of the uh, lady was, why are we not getting the money? It's nothing to do with our relationship. There's something to do with the fact that our own systems and policies are unfortunately such that the Arabs, when they want to invest here, and Saudi Arabia is a great example with which I have dealt with, is that they just can't find our system suitable for their investments. They cannot come here and say, fine, you have approved the refinery, I'm going to give you 30 million tons every year, and I'm going to put $3 billion or $4 billion for that. But when you say yes to a refinery to the Saudi Arabian, it means all everything is over. You have to start working on it tomorrow. Mm. You can't turn around and say, I have no environment clearance, I have mm. no state clearance, I have no water, <laughs> I have no electricity. I mean, it is the... It then is they'll go way. to China. It's, yeah, therefore they go to China. It's nothing to do with Islam or not Islam of the money coming in here. Do you think they'll support this movement that they're trying to control the Middle East? Sorry? 
that the role in Middle East that they are playing or in the yes. uh, this Arab world, would they be able to sustain that uh, role that they have played in the past? Well, uh, at the moment they are preoccupied. Europe is preoccupied. Uh, they do, the attention span is not there to look at all of these things because they have got very, very deep problems at home. And uh, the other day I was discussing exactly these problems with a friend and he came out with a startling joke. He was being funny, but somewhere there was something sinister that he was trying to communicate. What Americans need to get out of this, he said. Remember what got them out after World War II? I said, what? He said, the World War II. <laughs> they got out of the 1939 depression after World War II. So what the Americans and what the West needs is a very big war. It was eerie when he said it. And what he was saying, he was talking of a Malthusian solution. He was talking of populations. He said, look, these populations that are going to enter Europe, you know, which Europe does not want. You know, the, all these populations, all of that will be taken care of this time. If, and in any case, don't forget, what happens to Europe is not America's concern. It is an island protected by the Pacific on the one side and Atlantic on the other. They are secure and they don't give a damn. They need a very big war. Let it echo in your minds. Thank you very much. <laughs> this last bit was